steering back to the episode at hand, the fizzling infatuation between our hero Rosemary and the straw man of heteronormativity isn't the only relationship getting focus at the obstacle course. The entire episode is dedicated to bonds being formed amongst the cast. I think... Don't talk to me. Honestly, that was great. You're great. Oh, yes. You don't f a lot of time, but what you do f boy, it's succinct. You're brutal. I love it. What? What do you mean? I mean, I'm not the one that made slabs. <gasps> that was all you. Good job. Maybe you should sit with Snapdragon and me at lunch. You know what I mean? Following up from episode 5, Amaryllis has suddenly decided that Fime is simply the bee's knees. The way she did absolutely nothing to make Sage cry was so impressive that the resident bully of the class is adamant to make the dark elf her friend? Girl? Friend? A friend who happens to be a girl, it's not quite clear. In any case, the pair saunter through this magical hedge maze, because of course there is a magical hedge maze. Harry Potter did it, so darn it we can't pass up the chance to rip something off, tackling the lackluster challenges, whilst engaging the patented brand of High Guardian hijinks. By which I mean shit dialogue. What happened? Whatever, this is stupid. Are you gonna help me? Are you going to stop pretending that you don't know my name? Ugh. <sighs> Just tell me what happened. Fine. The hedge maze is magic and apparently doesn't like being hacked at with an axe. Hmm. Just give me my bracelet. It has my Terrasphere. <sighs> I don't get why you'd use magic in here. Kind of defeats the obstacle part of the obstacle course. Maybe I'm just testing your loyalty, elf girl. I'm loyal to people who bother to learn my name. Hmm, fair. Thank you, time. Since when is this a thing? Amaryllis called fine by her name in the previous episode. Hi, time. So where exactly is this elf girl thing coming from? I'd like to point out that the same person responsible for episode 5 co-wrote this episode also, and they also lent their voice to Amaryllis. So even the person who both writes and voices the character can't keep her motivations and relationships to other characters consistent between two episodes. This is pure apathy, plain and simple. I just, I don't see the point of this kind of thing. If we want a bunch of hedges moved, we just call a gardener. Watch it, my mom's a gardener. I mean, a botanist. What do your parents do? Travel, mostly. I was raised by nine au pairs. I wish I... Don't. Don't say you would trade all your money to have parents that would spend more time with you. Fime's comment here is extremely telling. First of all, she's being a bitch. One would think she, if anyone, would understand the value of family togetherness, seeing as it is her defining character motivation. But beyond that, this line is just out of place. Fime's comment plays into the meta-knowledge of having an archetypical pampered rich kid who seems cold and distant on the outside, but all they really want is to be loved. They may seem to have everything, but money won't buy happiness, that kind of deal. To anticipate and dismiss this trope in advance implies that Fime has seen this kind of thing before, but where? I don't think she has spent much time with anyone outside her own family, let alone to have seen this happen multiple times. And this world doesn't seem to be overly supplied with any type of pop culture or the like. Storytelling isn't a major pastime in this world, enough so that tropes like this would have already reached the status of cliches. So why did Fime jump to such a ridiculous assumption? <laughs> Are you kidding? I'd rather eat rocks than listen to my mother go on about her affairs. <laughs> We've got that in common. The simple truth is that this is purely a flat meta joke from the writers. It's immersion breaking first of all, all that's missing is the characters winking at the camera. And secondly, the sentiment behind it is absurdly misguided. 
The authors don't have the will or the skill to give any of their characters proper cohesive sympathetic characterization. The entire cast has the complexity of stale glass of water, with drops of diarrhea sprinkled in for good measure. And at the same time the writers have the gall to mock an archetype outside their repertoire. Admittedly corny though it may be. This show has strange priorities. Wait, do you mean affairs like the business stuff she does? Or do you mean- Oh! <laughs> She's a lush who never met a deckhand she didn't deck. With her hands! <laughs> She's a human shipwreck! But my dad's worse. <laughs> uh, wait, did you mean affairs like- Yeah, I meant the other thing. Oh, okay. Ugh. Moving from one gag dead on arrival to the next, the delivery and reactions lack any energy to properly convey the comedy, and the double entendre was weak at best. There isn't anyone in existence who could honestly misinterpret the situation. The comedy in this show is like listening to discarded Amy Schumer material. Pain to the very core of my soul. This means is terrible. Yep. Just like people. <laughs> yeah, well, we got that in common too. Misanthropy bringing people together. How wonderful. And with that bonding done, the pair are... Two people who tolerate one another. It's actually hard to say where the relationship stands going forth. Fyme and Amaryllis never do anything as twosome for the rest of the show. So establishing this pairing was complete waste of time. Though the same can be said about Parsley and Parnell. Those two are never even present at the same scene after this episode. Why do all of these random plot threads exist if nothing gets done with them? The show has a wide cast, so everyone just has to have something to do each episode? Is that it? That's just the way it is. Half the stuff going on serves no storytelling purpose. It's just noise and colors and motions barely resembling human interactions. Every episode, minutes upon end, just aimless lameness between boring characters, conversations about nothing. It honestly makes me question how much time the writers have actually spent talking and living with fellow human beings. Outside their own immediate circle of hive-minded hens, I mean. In my experience, the basic everyday pleasantries over a morning cup of coffee have more meaning than any of this strite. But as we find between the lines, or just firmly slouching all over the text, the creators of this show have some obviously unresolved traumas when it comes to human relations. Do you think Aster's cute? Uh-huh. Might be a few rooms short of a full set, but he's a babe. I don't see it. <coughs> Is he trying to teach Rose how to use her own sword? <laughs> yup. Not sure what you're worried about. There is only one surefire way to get over a crush. Spend time with them. Huh. A guy tried talking to me during lunch once and an entire clam fell out of his mouth. That's when I knew. Uh, nothing. Clams are bad. Don't look at me. That was a joke. I don't believe that guys are all awful. I mean, Hackberry Trout was ooky, but he never tried to explain magic to me. I think time's right about the antidote to crushes. <laughs> Once the mystery's gone, all that's left is an actual person. And usually that person has weird hangups. That is an alarmingly pessimistic view on people. Most people have weird hangups. That is what we call projection. And make no mistake, this sentiment isn't challenged in the show, so it is the author talking directly to the audience. That is how communication of ideas works. The writers clearly don't think highly of the people they share this planet with, and their ideals of romance are... they are interesting. While Rosemary is pining over Aster, there is another tale of blooming affection running adjacent to it. As you may remember from episode 3, Snapdragon has decided that Sage is remarkably appealing, 
owing to the fact how she mildly told off his best friend that one time. Anyway, here he is, finally making his move on the girl. Now I've been yammering on for several hours at this point, and I was thinking a change of perspective might be refreshing for a wee while. And since we are examining the mental movements of young girls, a more ladylike angle might be just the thing. You called. And she arrives right on cue. You mind taking this one? Not at all. As with every other plotline in this show, the romance between Snapdragon and Sage only serves to highlight just how unlikable the characters are. Snapdragon starts out strong. He offers his help to Sage, compliments her sorcery, and tells her she looks pretty. I mean, simple girls fall for that sort of thing. Just ignore the whole bullying thing. The show does. But even though she is being showered with attention and has her own training to worry about, Sage's attention keeps drifting towards Rosemary and her would-be arm candy. At every turn, she continues to obsess about her quote best friend, the only day so far when Rosemary has other priorities. And even though Snap tries to steer Sage's attention back on track repeatedly, Sage refuses to leave the subject be. Not until she and Snap have this ridiculous spat that she finally shuts up. We're a better team than R- Hmm. You're way too hung up on Rosemary. <sighs> you wouldn't get this. You're a guy. But Rosemary and I, we've been best friends for pretty much ever. <sighs> I understand friendship. Guy friendship is different. It isn't the same. Guys don't talk about their feelings. Let's just focus on the task. But Rose could do so much better. I know what she needs, and it's not him. <sighs> do I have to pay you? Do you want some kind of bribe? For what? To stop talking about Aster and Rosemary. She likes him. Who cares? I care. You don't say. Well, what if Amaryllis was going on and on about Aster all day? I'd be happy for her. She usually just talks about murder. Rose and I are girls. You and Amaryllis are a different story. In any case, guys just don't understand that the bond between girls is just deeper. And that, I'm a girl. You couldn't possibly understand. Girls and guys and guys and girls and girls and... I'm sick of you talking like that. I'm sick of... A lot right now. Snapdragon? Just finish the puzzle. And even though she clearly made Snap upset, it doesn't occur to her to apologize. Not until she sees Rosemary and Aster falling out. Then everything is sunshine and rainbows once more. Sage apologizes for being annoying, but only after she gets exactly what she wants. She knows that she has Rosemary all to herself once again, so now everything is fine. Now she can be all precious and nice and accommodating once her own non-issue has been resolved. Sage is a terrible friend. She feels this neurotic ownership towards Rosemary and takes pleasure from her misfortune. Her crust didn't turn out the way she had hoped and Sage takes glee from the fact. She's acting like a stereotypical mean girl, laughing behind someone's back and then acting all buddy-buddy when they meet again. And after spending an afternoon together, walking around and not really accomplishing anything, apparently in the writer's eyes, these two are now friends. Not only that, but they have also developed romantic chemistry. I guess Sage doesn't mind dating her on-off bully. In reality, neither of them have done or said anything to spark a proper romance. It's all just blushing over nothing. You... you've got a thing. Oh, um, hey, where's your hat? I'm experimenting with not wearing it all the time. <laughs> it looks good, and, and it's nice to see your hair. <laughs> mm, stop. They feel artificial together, like a romance novel written by an algorithm. The one big question a writer needs to answer when writing a romance is this. Why do these characters love each other? A pretty face only carries so far, there also has to be something valuable tucked within. 
neither Sage nor Snapdragon have any qualities worthy of admiration. Sage obsesses about her friend, whines about nothing, and has both an inferiority and superiority complex at the same time regarding her magic, bizarrely enough. She has most of the symptoms often associated with codependence issues. You don't want to date this kind of girl. Snapdragon's interest should have fizzled out after spending a day with Sage. Just like things ended with Rosemary and Aster. But that's the thing. In the end, Snap is really not looking for a romantic partner, but rather a shoulder to cry on. Someone to validate him while he deals with his own personal issues. Hey, if you ever want to talk about the heavier stuff... Yes, please. I could really... There's some stuff I could... I could really, really... I'd like to talk about. When Sage offers to hear him unload, his eagerness reveals his intentions. And just like Snap has an awful taste in girls, Sage has an awful taste in men. All that Sage knows about Snapdragon is that he is an occasional bully, a friend of Amaryllis, and has no mental fortitude to deal with an unknowing girl for a whole afternoon without escalating into this weird rant. Girls and guys and guys and girls and girls and... <sighs> made snap to snap. I am funny bot. And by the by, men talk about deep stuff and share their feelings too. Close bros exist. Emotions have nothing to do with sex. Rose and I are girls. You and Amaryllis are a different story. In any case, guys just don't understand that the bond between girls is just deeper. Hilariously enough, Sage's crime in this scenario wasn't that she downplayed the emotional side of men. In the writer's mind, her crime was that she dared to suggest that Snapdragon was a man. That's the subtext here. Snap is emotional, men aren't emotional, therefore Snap must be a girl. It's pure lunacy. The writers are so focused on foreshadowing Snapdragon's transition arc that they don't care what nonsense they end up spewing in the process. Men don't have feelings, not like girls. What a load of bull. All in all, Snap and Sage are heading in for a toxic relationship. They have nothing in common. They don't complement each other's personalities or attributes in any way. They are unpleasant to be around. They have no true companionship to offer. They will simply act as validation dispensers for each other. And this is presented as romantic? In real life this kind of relationship would be doomed from the start. It would end at the first sign of trouble or turn into a downward spiral of mutual codependency. Obviously, in a different show, if these issues and character flaws were presented as actual flaws, then there could be an interesting story to tell. But that's not how this show works. In High Guardian Spice, all the good characters are perfect as they are. And all the bad characters are one-dimensional punching bags with nothing redeemable about them. The concept of character development is far too complex to these writers. That about cover it? Thanks, that was lovely. May I bother you for assist later as well? I'll be around. Episode 6 marks the point where the creative team's mask not only slips, but falls off entirely and tumbles into the shredder, never to be seen again. Every decision with this show is made not in service of the narrative or the characters, but as an outlet for the author's revenge fantasies towards the male sex and a soapbox for some utterly bizarre ideals. The writers all suffer from unresolved personal issues, and they are using this show as a demented form of therapy. The protagonist learns that pretty people are not always what they appear to be on the surface, and that is a valuable lesson to give for 8-year-olds. The creators are adult children, they are writing a show allegedly aimed at mature audiences, and this is their ace material. 
almost makes me yearn for the quality of episode 1, when everything was merely lame and idiotic, instead of this constant cavalcade of horrid morals presented as virtuous. But on the brighter side, we are halfway through our journey. And as always, a huge thanks to each of you for listening till the end, for liking, subbing, commenting, it's all appreciated. And a special thank you goes to my supporters on Patreon, and an extra special thanks to my 10 euro patron Wyland. If you would like to join these fine people, or check out my other creative stuff, all the links are down below. Take care everyone, and I'll see you all in the next one.